So that's um, sort of the supplemental grading scale that I hope folks will, will learn in addition to the um, Spetzer Martin. Uh, it's actually quite useful in terms of the concept it teaches and, and, and what you can do with those. Um, there are a number of risk factors that go into determining whether or not an AVM ought to be treated and, and how best to do that. These are a few of them. We've kind of gotten at them with some of the grading scales, but um, the prior hemorrhage, uh, the, the nidus size, any venous outflow stenosis, as you might expect, if you've got a stenosis, you're going to have um, outflow uh, resistance and therefore build up pressure and potentially rupture, deep location, uh, periventricular in the basal ganglia, deep venous drainage into the galenic system, feeding by perforators, which of course can be small, tortuous, and um, uh, subserve significant um, uh, functions such as the thalamus perforators. And then finally, uh, any feeding by the posterior circulation that um, portends higher risk um, as well. Natural history has been studied by a number of groups. Um, unruptured AVMs uh, portend a risk of about two to 4% risk per year. Ruptured AVMs are more like 1% per month. So once it's ruptured, sort of cats out of the bag and it's time to, to treat it. The, the question of to treat or not to treat um, is sort of moot at that point. And this is, these, these become much higher risk lesions that uh, deserve our attention. Um, on top of that, I think it's important to understand sort of what each rupture um, uh, means in terms of what it does to the patient. So each, each hemorrhage uh, carries with it about a 10% risk of death, okay? Um, and about a 30 to 50% risk of major morbidity. So uh, we, so the risk of waiting to allow um, the AVM to, to, to heal or to, um, to be treated by radiosurgery, for instance, as we'll get into, carries with it some consequence, right? If this were to rupture while you're waiting for it to, um, uh, for the radiation to work, um, that can be very deleterious to the patient, okay? Um, let's look a little bit about at, at some of the, um, uh, the imaging characteristics um, of, uh, of these things and how we can use these to help us to understand what's going on and what do we need to do in reaction to that. This is from a paper, um, it's now you know, nearly a decade old, looking at using some of the newer, then newer imaging techniques that still aren't entirely standard in terms of our um, uh, diagnostic armamentaria, but I think that are um, quite useful. Again, looking at this, um, AVM, we'll, we'll look on the next slide at what we can do with this. This is, of, of course, just plain old 2D uh, catheter angiography. And you can see the artery coming in, you see the intervening nidus, and then you see the veins on the backside going out. Um, one of the advantages of angiography is, of course, you are able to capture uh, time. So you have temporal resolution in addition to spatial resolution. So you can follow what normally would have been artery capillary vein with the dye flowing through the, that spectrum. Um, you're now able to, to query, okay, when does the vein show up? Um, uh, are there, there um, certain torrents that are higher flow than others and, and really get a sense of the hemodynamics of um, the lesion. Uh, another way, so this is um, what we call parametric imaging. This is something we've helped to um, co-develop here, uh, which is essentially looking at to take the qualitative aspects of angiography basically I use my eyes and I interpret what I see and putting numbers to it, making it qualitative. So going from quantitative angiography to, uh, sorry, qualitative angiography to quantitative angiography. And in this case, what we're looking at is essentially the transit time. How long does it take for a bolus of dye to get from artery to capillary to vein and then color mapping and saying, okay, well, this is our pre-embolization. You can see a big venous varics here. You can see the veins going out. Um, and obviously red is fastest, yellow, medium, green, slow. And we can see that we've um, altered that by doing some, uh, some manipulation, in this case, an embolization. You have much less flow in certain vessels. You can see the, um, the varix is um, significantly reduced and you've actually changed the flow dynamics um, on the, um, through the lesion, okay? And that's something you don't necessarily get from just the 2D representation. Um, this is not putting a color map to the quantitative um, data that can be helpful, right? And this can potentially be useful for answering the questions of, okay, what do I treat first? What are the most important lesions? What rupture, what, what do I, what's gonna happen when I'm done with the case? You know, I did whatever I'm gonna do, the patient goes back to the ICU. The question is what happens next? Is this patient at high risk for 
um, a rupture event still? Do we need to, to worry about uh, keeping the blood pressure low, you know, manipulating the breathing, whatever it might be to, um, to keep them safe? Okay. Um, so uh, the, this can also be helpful, these imaging adjuncts for really understanding the angioarchitecture of the vessels and, and um, picking out what's going in, what's coming out, and what do I need to worry about? Um, so exact origin and numbers of arterial feeders can be really difficult when you've got very complex lesions. And here we're using a four-dimensional MRI. So obviously XYZ, um, three-dimensional, but then you add in the time. So uh, you're not just getting a snapshot. What you're doing is uh, watching essentially the, the virtual contrast, as it were, flow through. The, the, you're watching the contrast going in and out, and you're able to track arterial capillary venous phase um, going through these. And in, and in something like this, you can really understand a little bit better. Okay, we've got left ACA feeders, we've got MCA feeders, we've got artery Huebner um, that's plugging in and really help to dissect out what it is. Give your um, mind a better chance of, uh, of developing a, a cogent um, uh, treatment plan when you know exactly what it is you're up against. Okay, This is perfusion imaging. This has become much more common in the context of stroke. We use this all the time with... Um, the AI software, Rapid, Viz, um, to be able to look at um, sort of various uh, different variables that help us to understand, okay, what's the territory that's at risk? Where is it taking longer for the dye to get in? Um, and then understanding sort of the functional aspect of it, is that, uh, you know, uh, stunned tissue or is that dead tissue? In this case, we're looking at it in the context of AVMs using things like cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow to understand in this case, a steel phenomenon. So the flow through the AVM is so high, it's actually stealing flow from normal tissue. And that can, of course, have implications for um, symptomatology. So this is from a, a paper from Ali Alaraj and, and, and his group looking at sort of some of these characteristics and how that coincides with the various presentations. The most common presentations for these, of course, being hemorrhage, seizure, and so not only you just find it because you, you happen to be looking or um, numbness, weakness, sort of focal neurologic deficits. And there are certain characteristics that tend to correlate. Um, so for instance, uh, if we look over here in the, um, in the punchline column over here on the far right, you can see that larger volume associates with seizure, lower flow is associated with hemorrhage, higher flow associated with seizure, um, so on and so forth, right? So we can sort of use that to help us to understand symptomatology, potentially risk for future symptoms, um, as we're evaluating these lesions. Um, so first question when you're faced with sort of somebody showing up in clinic is always to treat or not to treat. And as I've already said, if the lesion is ruptured, then um, that decision is pretty easy. The vast majority of them, however, are unruptured. And the question then is, well, what do we do with this? There are certain features that we can use to, to, help, to help us to kind of break down and understand large nidus size, um, uh, these, are, these are features can, uh, to, that, are, that are essentially high risk. So a large nidus size, location and functional brain, a deep location. And again, the problem there is being able to get to it. Uh, the functional distribution of arterial pedicles. So if you wanna go and glue something shut, um, what's that gonna do? Is it a large number of pedicles or a small number of pedicles? Um, again, um, for both for surgery and for, um, uh, for endovascular therapy, that's gonna be important. Other microscopic features can be uh, equally important. Things like, do you have a direct fistulous component? So you don't have any intervening nidus, you go directly artery to vein and they're plugged in directly. Um, some peri or prenidal aneurysms where you've got that focal dilatation, um, those tend to be higher risk for rupture and often deserve our attention before maybe the rest of the lesion. Uh, exclusively deep venous drainage has been shown to be high risk. And then of course the venous varices, the aneurysms on the venous side. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.